Welcome to one of the best single day road trips we have ever done along Highway 99 in British Columbia, also known as the Sea to Sky Highway. On the 95 mile drive, you'll leave Vancouver and head towards the rugged mountains of Whistler, driving along the Howe Sound pretty much the entire way. There are weeks worth of adventures on this drive, but in this video, we're gonna show you how to do the most you possibly can in 24 hours. Be sure to let me know what I left off as I'm definitely gonna do this drive again and let's jump into our road trip on the Sea to Sky Highway. Good morning, we're leaving Vancouver and we're starting our next road trip one day on the Sea to Sky Highway, heading all the way up to Whistler. We started our day though with some Tim Hortons. That's the way you do it in Canada, right? About 25 minutes outside of downtown Vancouver, we made it to our first stop, Whitecliff Park. Whitecliff Park is a beautiful area for photography, but it's also a loved area for scuba diving. This is our first stop on the Sea to Sky Highway, and I have to say, it's a pretty good one. It was actually one of the first marine protected parks in Canada, and we saw lots of people getting ready to scuba dive when we were there. For us though, we just walked around a little bit, took a few pictures, and then continued on. What do you think, Pop? Was that a good first stop, or should we just head back to Vancouver? Oh, it was nice. It was pretty. Looking <laughs> at the water and the, that big rock, that was pretty cool. I don't know. That's not very convincing. Maybe he's, uh, he's done with the road trips. Maybe I pushed him too hard. <laughs> this highway was originally a gravel road that was used to access some of the natural resources in the interior part of British Columbia. In the 1960s, the road was built in order to connect Vancouver and Whistler, which had become a popular skiing destination. There weren't any signs for two of the viewpoints that we were planning to go to, so we made a U-turn and we backtracked a little bit. This is Archer Point where we're at right now. A few of the best viewpoints are only accessible driving south, so if you want to see those, you will have to turn around like we did. Not a bad viewpoint. It has a nice bench that you can just sit at and look out over this. Pops liked the purple flowers and he looked them up and he figured out that they're called what? Called foxglove, I think. Beautiful flowers. Heading a little further south again, we made it to our next viewpoint, which was called Tunnel Point. This is cool because it shows all of the important geographic locations for the Squamish people and then it talks about each one of them right here. There's not a great viewpoint here, but it's definitely cool to see the history. Heading south one more time, we turned around near Crystal Falls, which is a small waterfall right on the side of the road. There's not really a designated pull-off for this one and if you don't want to stop, you can see it from the passenger side window as well. This is definitely a hard one to visit. It's right along the side of the road and there's only enough room for basically one car to pull off here, but still a nice waterfall and great views across the water as well. After seeing Crystal Falls, we were back heading north along the highway and our next stop brought us to Shannon Falls. So I have a 10.30 reservation at the mine, which is about five minutes back down the road. But we're early and I wanted to get to Shannon Falls because it's a Saturday and I know it's going to be packed later. It was perfect. We were able to get a parking spot, no problem, see Shannon Falls and then head back to the mine. Shannon Falls is one of the most popular stops along the entire drive, so do be sure to plan for that if you're going during the summer or on the weekend. The hike to the waterfall viewpoint is about 1 mile or 1.5 kilometers round trip. It's relatively easy and once you get there you'll be greeted by the third largest waterfall in British Columbia. It's a little bit difficult to see with the way the trees have grown up, but you can look up at it and see most of the falls. Pops has fallen asleep after seeing the third tallest waterfall in British Columbia. That thing is impressive. There's a huge amount of water coming out. The falls go so far up. It's, it's, it's really, really impressive. It falls 335 meters or almost 1,100 feet. That was a beautiful waterfall and I'm glad that we checked that off because I think it's going to be busy later and now we're heading back down the road to the mine. About five minutes down the road is another one of the most popular stops along the drive, the Britannia Mine. So I got about 45 minutes before my tour starts. Pops had no desire to go underneath and into the cave, so it's just me. 
There's lots of great history videos about the mine that I'll link to in the description and I won't say all of it here, but basically this mine was in operation for around 70 years and was one of the largest producers of copper in the British Empire, plus one of the largest mining operations in Canada. Wow, this is the car that would take the miners to work. That looks like no fun to ride in. <laughs> and this that you're seeing right in front of you is actually an ambulance car. That's where the person rode going to the hospital. There are many different buildings that you can explore while you're waiting for your tour to start and there's so much information and interactive exhibits for kids. Plus, if you're interested, you can also try your hand at gold panning. It's gold. I don't see any gold. If you're interested in the history of mining in the area or in Vancouver's history, this is definitely a place you're going to want to spend a few hours exploring. Apparently this is so you can pose with the miners, but Pops is in here for me to make him do that, so not as cool as just me. Here's the mine toilet. Looks like a lot of fun. Eventually, it was time for my tour, which is definitely the highlight of the museum. Hey, for the tour. If you follow my videos, then you know I love visiting mines, and I've been in a bunch of them over the years. However, this was one of the most unique, as you got to take a 10-minute ride on an old mine train in order to take you in. The ride doesn't last that long, but it's just so cool to enter the mine in this way. Once you get off, your guide takes you on a 30 minute tour which walks you step by step through the entire mining process. After leaving the mine, the tour walks you past an area where they keep all of the cores that they use during the mining process, and then you enter one of the top attractions which is the show known as Boom. I won't spoil it for you as this show is great and it's won international awards. It basically brings the entire mining building back to life in one section, and it's really fun to see. After the show ends, you're given about 10 minutes to explore the bottom of the historic mill, and that ends your time at the Mine Museum. That was really well done. It was a great tour and a great show at the end. Definitely see it if you're going on this drive, but now we're heading on to lunch. Right next to the mine is a lunch spot that came highly recommended to us called Mountain Woman. Pop's got a burger and I went with fish and chips. I mean, it's not health food, but it's a great easy stop for lunch. From there, it was back on the road and about 10 minutes north to the Sea to Sky Gondola. You guys, look at who I convinced to go on the gondola with me. We haven't made it to the top yet, but Hey, there's still a chance for you to back out. I made sure I went to the bathroom before I got home. <laughs> this is not one of Pop's favorite things, so be sure to leave a like. And I hold on to something that's going to make any difference. Note that this attraction can sell out in advance on busy weekends and that it costs around $70. See a teeny bit of Shannon Falls over there, just barely. Pops is facing a fear right now. I am very proud of him. I will say that that initial uphill, you probably gain like a thousand feet in maybe a tenth of a mile. I don't know, it's basically just straight up the rock hillside, but now we're in a much better area. I didn't know what to expect from this ride, but I can easily say that if you're there on a clear day, it's something you absolutely have to do. Just the ride up alone is beautiful with views over the house sound and the massive mountain ranges that surround you. Getting just a little bit lucky because the cloud level is right above our viewpoint. So hopefully when we get up there, we're gonna see some good views. And all of Pops' work would not be for nothing. <laughs> After about 15 minutes, we made it to the top. You guys check out the suspension bridge, wow. There are two main reasons to take this gondola. The first is the 100 meter long suspension bridge and the other is the viewpoints over the house sound. Was it worth it Pops? It's beautiful here, that's for sure. <laughs> this mountain would be right there. 
Pops has the most irrational fears ever. He's afraid of the gondola, but he's not afraid of walking over this massive suspension bridge. Maybe I feel like in all the in all the Indiana Jones movies, snatch <laughs> you can hold on, right? Canada sure does love its suspension bridges, and it's easy to see why. This is quite the experience. It's bouncy. I think it's once you make it across, there's another viewpoint, which is basically the same as the one in the front, but it's cool to be able to see that viewpoint from here. I hope this is coming through in video. This is one of the coolest places I've ever been to. These views are insane, and to have a suspension bridge here too, man. I currently have Pops standing out there waiting to take a video of me. That's commitment right there. Be sure to give this video a like for Pop's commitment to the shot. We're saying goodbye to the apparently not terrifying suspension bridge and going in to the terrifying gondola. The terrifying gondola, no argument there. <laughs> I just want to say as a head for the gondola, it's been nice to know you via these videos and take care. See you I'll in see you. heaven. I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> There's a bunch of hiking trails and other stuff up there, but since we're only doing this drive in one day, we didn't have time to do that on this trip. It is expensive to come up here, so do know that going in, but man, that was a cool experience. Beautiful views, gorgeous views, yeah. There's Pup's favorite drop right there. Yeah, this is Woo! Hey, he's still alive. He made it. I have another day of life. <laughs> it's pretty hard to beat a town with such a cool mountain right next to it. But we're going to get some coffee and donuts before we continue on. It seemed like a good time to have a cup of coffee and a donut, which is it ever a bad time to have a donut? So we headed over to Fox and Oak in the town right next to where the gondola was. All right, mango passion fruit. Sweet, doughy, good consistency of dough to glaze as a strong donut. We're on our way to our next waterfall and we saw a sign for a viewpoint. You know we can't pass up a good viewpoint. Let's see how it is. This is a great place to get out and stretch your legs, but it wasn't the best viewpoint we'd seen on the drive. Continuing on, our next stop took us to another amazing waterfall that you can see along this drive. We're about 15 minutes south of Whistler and we're heading out to Brandywine Falls. This trail is approximately 500 meters, which is about a third of a mile round trip. After passing the train track, you arrive at the first viewpoint and I have to say, this is an impressive waterfall. It falls about 70 meters or 230 feet into the canyon below. There's also a second waterfall viewpoint that you can walk to, but it's much more obstructed than the first. There's one more viewpoint at the very end, which looks out over Daisy Lake. This is a nice short trail, two viewpoints of the waterfall, one of the lake behind it, definitely worth stop. After saying goodbye to Brandywine Falls, we continued toward Whistler and then pulled off at another hike I was really interested in seeing. Train wreck site and suspension bridge. That's a trail. Have you ever hiked to a train wreck before? I have not. <clears throat> Be interesting to see. This really has been an epic road trip and we just got a couple more stops after this, including downtown Whistler. We've made it to the suspension bridge. After about 10 minutes of walking, you'll make it to the suspension bridge, which goes over a beautiful creek. Not a bad suspension bridge. Look at that river. It is flowing. And after crossing the suspension bridge, you can start seeing the train wreck right there. According to the information plaque, this train wreck happened in 1956. All right, this happened four months after I was born, but I'll be really clear, I had nothing to do with it, nothing <laughs> at all. On that day, a bunch of train cars were filled with lumber and were making their way to Whistler, 
but they were behind schedule and so the engineer pushed the train to double the speed limit and it went around a really sharp curve and derailed. The train route was vital to bring resources between the neighboring towns and so they salvaged five of the trains and then pulled the other seven which they couldn't salvage to this location. This is definitely one of the strangest things I've hiked to. There's a pristine river right there. And then there's all of these train cars right here. While this may seem like a strange thing to explore, it is an official trail with signs and information plaques all along the way. Plus, there were dozens of people out there with us exploring all of these broken down train cars. All right, well, that's certainly a pretty unique and easy hike on the drive, but we are heading on to Whistler. After making it back to the car, it was only about a 10 minute drive to downtown Whistler. Note that this place is incredibly popular, but it wasn't too bad when we got there late on a Saturday. We made it to Whistler. This is one of the places we're gonna be spending the least amount of time. I hope to come back here and spend a whole weekend. But we're just gonna see the Olympic stuff, the rings, and then have some dinner and then head on. This main area is called Olympic Plaza and it's where you can see the Olympic rings from the Winter Olympics that were held here in 2010. You'll have to wait your turn if you want to get a photo with them since there's always a bunch of people there, but this area is fun to explore with lots of shops and restaurants and other things to see. This is a cool town. It looks like it'll be awesome to explore. Let me know what you think of Whistler in the comments if you've been. For us, the main order of business was to get dinner at Peaked Pie. Is it healthy if you cover your peas in gravy? Absolutely. <laughs> Peaked Pie is an Australian bakery which makes famous Australian meat pies. All right, so we got it with the toppings, which means that it comes with mashed potato, peas, and gravy. And Pop's got steak, and Chunky I got- Chunky steak and pepper. You got what? Chunky steak and pepper. And I got buttered chicken. I actually had one of these when I was in Australia. This is delicious. Very hearty, you know, kind of like, you know, down home food, it's delicious. All right, looks like a storm might be rolling in, but we got 20 minutes to drive to our last waterfall and our last stop on this road trip. While most people stop this road trip in Whistler, we wanted to do the entire thing, which actually ends in Pemberton. So we pulled off at a few more viewpoints along the way and then stopped at Nairn Falls. This trail is already starting awesome with that beautiful river and the color of the water. This has been an amazing day. One of the best I can remember for just sheer amount of awesome stuff you can do on a road trip like this. I'm excited to end it with a waterfall. I have about 2% battery left on my camera, so I'm trying to hold off until I get to the waterfall, so you might see some more phone shots here. This hike is about one and a half miles round trip and it follows the water the entire way there. There's about 300 feet of elevation gain, but it's mostly just gradual up and downs as you go along the cliffside. Eventually the trail will become rock and you can go up to one of the three viewpoints. It's not a traditional waterfall with the way that it's going through that canyon and you can't really see the falls as well, but it is awesome. The best part about the waterfall was the rock gorge that it fell into and how rapid the water was flowing. Look at it, it's gotta be going under one of these rocks right here in order to come out. There's even like a whirlpool effect right there. I figured that was it and I almost left before heading down to a lower viewpoint, which was the best one here. Look at this lower part, it's insane. While it wasn't very tall, here the water just crushed over the rocks and down into the pool below. That was next level. That was the best way to end this road trip. Incredible waterfall. And with that, our epic one day on the Sea to Sky Highway is done. We got five minutes to Pemberton where our hotel is, which is the official end of the highway. I don't know, that was probably one of the most beautiful road trips I've ever done in one day. What do you think? Especially in a short time frame, we jammed so much in, it was incredible. If you're ever in the area, especially in the summer, you have to do this one. We will see you on the next video.